Welcome back to the Plant Basics series. In this series, we cover the basics of plants, structures, functions, features, and generally how plants actually work. In this episode seven, we are covering words that all end in fight. So all of the fights. These words can define specific characteristics about plants or give us information about the type of habitats that these plants might live in. Before we get into it, I just would like to ask if you could give this video a like and a comment or even subscribe if you like this content just to let me know how you're feeling about these kinds of videos. This is the first Plant Basics episode I've done in relation to kind of words or naming around plants and this is something I definitely want to do more on because there's so much that can be covered and it's a really useful skill to learn to just gather more information about the plants that you might be caring for. So when you see fight at the end of a word or a kind of a combination word, this can tell you something about where it grows or what type of habitat it likes or specific characteristics about the plant itself. And so it's a really useful skill to be able to recognize these words or even just be aware of them to look them up. It's because you can gather all of that information that might help you care for your plant in a better way. As far as the etymology of this word, fight in Greek essentially just means plant. So it will essentially tell you something about the plant that it is describing. So having a basic understanding of some of these words can kind of give you instant information about a plant without having to look up kind of detailed research on where it lives and habitat it likes, etc, etc. It might give you some very key information in a very fast and efficient way. Of course, Google and OpenAI are always there to help you with this stuff. And I do encourage you to stay curious about these types of words. So in this episode, I'm going to cover some of the common fight words that are regularly encountered and hopefully you'll be able to retain this information going into the future. Obviously, I cannot cover them all or we would be here all day, but I picked out some of ones that I've recognized a bit, some that are very key for understanding habitats, etc, etc. So let's get into the first fight word. And I've kept this first because I personally feel that this is the one that most of you would have heard of, especially when we're in the realm of talking about houseplants and things like that. So this word is epiphyte. So the definition of an epiphyte is a plant or a plant-like organism that grows on the surface of other plants, but is for physical support and is not for parasitic reasons. So most of our houseplants actually fit into this category. And that's why I think most of you would have heard this word before. Typically, they derive their water source from moisture or air or debris surrounding where it's growing as it's growing on another plant. So epi in Greek means upon or on. So it's basically like on plant. <laughs> It is very straightforward. It is growing on another plant, essentially. So this fight word is to describe its growth habit. So usually epiphytes do not have their roots in soil. So we're talking about air plants, bromeliads, mosses, orchids, and 89% of terrestrial epiphytes are flowering plants. But some of you may be thinking that doesn't make any sense because my houseplant epiphytes are growing in soil as well. So this brings me on to the fact that epiphytes are actually divided into two kind of subcategories. So they are either holo epiphytes or hemi epiphytes. So a holo epiphyte will spend its entire life cycle on the surface of another plant without touching the ground. Whereas a hemi epiphyte will typically spend half of its life cycle on the ground, generally starting on the ground in substrate, in soil, and then will spend the second part of its life cycle on the surface of another plant. So many of our most common houseplants, your epipremnums or your pothos, 
your philodendron, they, these are all climbers, but generally they start off in the base or the ground in your pot and then they grow upwards and that is their part of the life cycle that they spend growing on the surface of another plant. So this can tell you a lot about the plants that you're growing in the sense that even your climbers, what will they grow best on? Yes, other things that are like plants, so branches, tree trunks, wood, moss, all of that stuff can replicate the natural environment that these hemi-epiphytes generally grow on. And of course, then your other version, your holo-epiphytes, things like your air plants, which you can't see here, but I do have a few of those growing on a branch. They do not need contact with the ground at any point in their life cycle. So leading on from that, our next fight word is a phorophyte. So this is actually to describe the plant upon which an epiphyte grows. So these are generally your larger plants that would be able to provide physical support to your epiphytes. So they're generally large trees or larger mature plants in the wild. So phoro in Greek actually means bearer or carrier. So it's like the carrier plant. And that can tell you that other plants like to grow on it. Of course, phorophytes can all provide different conditions in the wild. You can have different pHs, different bark, different like shedding rate of bark, the sap, the texture and size of the bark, which will all be specific to um, the epiphytes needs. Phorophytes therefore are super important for conservation and can show you that we really need a very biodiverse um, variety of plants in order for other plants to survive. It's never such a targeted action where you can focus on one let's say philodendron that is nearly going extinct in the wild you will also have to think about its phorophyte because that is essential habitat that it needs to complete its life cycle to mature to get that physical support and hopefully flower and reproduce so the next fight word is a lithophyte now i'm going to give you a moment to think about what that could possibly mean have you heard the word litho have you heard lith do you have any idea about what that could mean i'll wait and if not, <laughs> it, litho is the Greek word for stone. So it's basically telling you a stone plant. So this describes plants that grow on stone. So lithophytes are also kind of divided into two subcategories of lithophytes. These are epilithophytes or endolithophytes. So epi, as we know in Greek, means upon. So these are plants that will grow on the surface of rocks or stones themselves. And endo in Greek means internal or within. So these describe plants that grow within rocks, so generally within kind of crevices and cracks within rocks or stones. So those are your endolithophytes. These are also called chasmophytes sometimes, so not to be confused, but it's the same meaning essentially. As well, we can have obligate lithophytes where they only grow on the surface of rocks and that's it, or you can have your facultative lithophytes where they kind of grow half on a rock and half on some other substrate or surface as well. So these are kind of similar like your holo and hemi epiphytes, just describing um, how much of their habitat or life cycle is spent on the surface of rocks or stones. Lithophytes obviously gather their nutrients from water that is kind of trickling down through rocks or the surfaces of stones. So being able to grow inside a crevice is generally better because that is where the natural water flow may be. And nitrogen is only generally available through the air, so they're not getting it from any kind of soil or substrates. So plants that can be lithophytes as well include tillandsia, orchids, ferns, mosses, liverworts, and some carnivorous plants. So generally these plants have adapted to some extent to survive with very little to no nitrogen nutrient content, which is why things such as the carnivorous plants will have adapted to get their nitrogen from some other source. Our next fight is a geophyte. So geo in Greek means earth. So you may be thinking, does that just mean 
that's in substrate or in soil. Not ness yes, because <laughs> it means earth plant, but what it's telling you is actually that part of the plant structure will be underground or in the earth. So geophytes generally have structures inside the earth acting as kind of storage organs. So examples of these could be plants with tubers, corms, um, kind of a bulbous uh, organ underneath the level of the soil. And these generally store food and water. So those are your geophytes. This next one you may have also heard of um, because it is a very commonly used word and is actually sometimes considered as its own taxonomic group. And that is your bryophytes. So bryo in Greek means moss or tree moss. So it's essentially a moss plant. <laughs> um, so this does describe mosses but bryophytes include mosses, liverworts and hornworts. All of those three are classified as bryophytes. These are non-vascular plants and it is estimated that around 20,000 species of bryophytes exist today and those are obviously only the ones that have been discovered. The next one is quite interesting, maybe one that you haven't heard of before, an endophyte. So we've had endo before in your endolithophytes and endo meaning inner or within. So an endophyte is typically describing a fungus or bacteria that lives inside another plant for its life cycle without causing disease, very important part of that. So actually almost every plant that has ever been studied for endophytes have been shown that endophytes are actually present. So it is thought, while there isn't a huge amount of research done on this and there's still a lot of unknowns, it is thought that endophytes can play a role in preventing disease, um, preventing overpredation, resistance to insects, pathogens, etc. So endophytes could be a very interesting one, especially into the future when more research is done. The next one is quite simple, but it's a halo fight. So halo in Greek means salt. So this is essentially your salt plant. So plants that have adapted to live in high saline environments. They can grow in soil or waters that have a high salt content. So this is essentially telling you directly what its habitat requirements are. These could be things like mangroves, swamps, marshes, seashores, or saline semi-deserts. Halophytes are actually considered to be a very, very small percentage of all plants in the world today. On the other hand, the rest of that percentage goes to glycophytes. <laughs> so most of our plants are actually glycophytes. Glyco in Greek means sugars, so sugar plants. However, they are the opposite of halophytes. So they are not salt tolerant at all, and they will be negatively affected by high salt environments. Next up is our hydrophytes. I'll give you a moment to guess what that is. Hydro, very obvious. Your water plants, so obviously hydro in Greek means water. So this describes plants that grow only in water environments. Next up is an interesting one, one that I come across in my job quite a bit, but may not be as obvious as some of my other ones. So these are macrophytes. So macro in Greek means large. These are essentially plants that are large enough to be seen with the naked eye, which obviously covers a lot. However, macrophytes generally actually refer to aquatic plants. And I guess they're called microphytes possibly to distinguish these, um, larger aquatic plants from algae and other small different stuff going on in the water environment. And obviously these smaller plants are known as microphytes. Of course, as we just covered, another term for, me, for these plants could be hydrophytes, plants that grow on or in water, but macrophytes describe the kind of larger version of that and separate it even further. So the last one we're going to cover today are zero fights. So zeros in Greek means dry, so dry plants. So these are species of plants that are adapted to survive in environments with very little water. So obviously this covers 
plants like cacti, gymnosperms, plants that are adapted to go for very long periods without water. Some of them can store water. They can also sometimes survive complete desiccation of their tissues. And generally these plants have waxy leaves and thorny textures in order to prevent um, moisture loss in any way. And generally their roots can go quite deep and they may have a big tap root. So those are your zero fights. Of course, there are so many other examples of fights that can be included in kind of the botany world. It does extend to other kind of um, worlds, I guess, in other ways where plants may be not necessarily described, but it may descri describe the usage of plants in other kind of industries and stuff. I personally always have a curiosity when it comes to like plant naming in Greek and Latin and all of this stuff because having some kind of understanding of some of these words can tell you so much like I've just said um, and it isn't always that difficult to figure out like you have your baseline you know that fight means plant you know that epi means on, <laughs> and endo means within, etc. And sometimes that can kind of seep into your brain and be telling you much more about these plants in a very kind of non-complicated um, way. If you enjoyed this and you would like further episodes to be on plant naming structures, please do let me know in the comments because it's something I would love to cover, but I would be really interested if you would enjoy that as well and if it would be worth my time. If there's anything specific that you would like to know of as well, please recommend down below. If not, some examples could be covering kind of the order, family, genus, species, implant naming and how to kind of decipher that, all of that kind of good stuff. So please do let me know. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you very soon in the next one. Bye.